Mushmouth is here. Oh shit, here we go. The biggest shit talker in the West. I just want to quickly thank Ali D for suggesting this trial. I was completely out of the loop on this one. Unfortunately, things are extremely busy for me right now, but I believe I can make this work. As per usual, I'll be cutting out all the lunch breaks, coffee breaks, piss breaks, along with as many pregnant pauses, coughing, and lip smacking as possible. And I'm just going to let this discount Louis Anderson tell you the story. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Judge. At least the way he sees it, anyway. Senseless and horrific acts of violence when all Nikolai had to do was walk away. That's what you're going to see in this case. You'll see he eventually did walk away, but not until after stabbing five people. As Jeff Waterman said, my name is Carl Anderson. My co-counsel, Brian Smestad, and I represent the state of Wisconsin in this case. It's our duty to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Nikolai Mew is guilty of all charges. You're going to hear in this trial that Nikolai said it was self-defense. But there's a video of what happened. You're going to see the video. You're going to see the sequence of events. You're going to hear a lot in the video. You're going to hear people yelling at Nikolai over 20 times, some version of get away, go away. You hear the boys, the teenagers yelling, get away, get away from us, get the fuck away, get back, get away from us, walk away, walk away. You're going to hear that there's another group of tubers, adults, who hear this and come over to help the boys. You're going to hear them yelling, go, get your ass and go, go, get your ass and go, 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 go. You're going to hear that Isaac's group and the group of adult tubers, I'll probably refer to them as the Carlson group throughout the trial, didn't know each other, still don't know each other. You're going to hear from both of those groups testify about what they saw. You're going to hear that there's six victims in this case, one that was punched, five that were stabbed, and you're going to hear from all those victims except Isaac Schumann. That's because on July 30th, of 2022, Nikolai Mew killed him. It was the summer before Isaac's senior year of high school. He was living in Stillwater, Minnesota with his mom, stepdad, brother, and stepsister. He was looking forward to going to college after high school. The photo on his left is his last school photo from his junior year of high school. The photo in the middle was his last birthday. He went out to celebrate at a restaurant with his family when he turned 17. Photo on the right, he was showing off the new trailer he bought to his mom for his new car detailing business. On July 3rd, 2022, it was a nice day. Weather was in the 80s, perfect sunny day for tubing. You'll see body cam, but it was busy. There was a lot of tubers on the river. Isaac was tubing with five of his best friends. Alex Fang. Juwan Cockfield, Owen Palaquin, Ryan Nelson, Landon Wire, and the last photo is Isaac. His friends called him Bike. These are, you'll see, uh, this is how they were dressed when they were on the river. These are screen grabs from that day. The other group you hear a lot about is the Carlson group. Only one who was stabbed out of Isaac's group was Isaac. The rest of the People stabbed and punched were from the Carlson group. Riley Madison was stabbed. Dante Carlson was stabbed. AJ Martin was stabbed. Tony Carlson was stabbed. Madison Cohen was punched. The other group you'll hear a lot about is Nikolai Mew's group. Some of these folks you'll hear more about than others, likely. Ariel. You'll see him in the video of the incident. Gilma, I expect you'll hear testimony from her. Eric Von Williams, you may see in some body cam, your testimony. Nikolai Mew, 
That's Sandy Mule, Nikolai's wife. Ernesto, you'll see in the incident video also. So Nikolai and Ernesto worked together. Um, a lot of these other people knew Nikolai through Ernesto or just met at Nikolai that day. Sergio, was, he's the far right. He wasn't actually in this picture, but he was the last member of their group. So all these groups were tubing on the Apple River. They're all out with friends. They're all drinking. This is a map of the Apple River. Tubers started at River's Edge up on the top right, and they kind of tube in this snaky U shape, down and then left and up. A lot of the tubers stop and did stop in this case at the hideaway. There's a bar there, there's a beach spot to hang out. The incident, the stabbings, occurred shortly before the tubers reached the 35 bridge that crosses over the river. You might hear it referred to as the Sunrise Bridge. And then the place where tubers exit is called the Village Park Exit. And you'll hear that the only group of these three groups that made it to the exit was Nikolai's group. You'll hear that shortly before the incident, Ariel's phone got knocked in the water. It was in a waterproof case. You'll hear testimony that he wasn't that worried about it. He said he has insurance for his phone, but Nikolai insisted on looking for it. So the group ends up waiting at the sand, at a sandbar. Nikolai goes downstream. He's got goggles and snorkel. He's going to look for the phone. Isaac's group is tubing a ways downstream. And you'll hear them describe that this older guy is tubing next to their tubes in extremely shallow water, getting really close to them, not really saying anything. He's got a, they all describe, will describe a strange look in his face. They're creeped out by him. You'll hear from several of them that he said something about looking for little girls. You'll hear from one or two that he said something about looking for a phone. Jawan, second from the left, filmed the main video in this case. He also filmed a nine second video shortly before that main video. And in that nine second video, you'll see Juwan saying, he said he's looking for little girls, he's a raper. And Nikolai is walking away. He doesn't keep walking away. At the end of that video, he stops and he turns around. Two seconds later is when that main video starts. The video of the stabbings. You'll see at that start of the main video, Nikolai is walking towards the group of tubers. They're down in their tubes, the teenage boys, Isaac's group. In the beginning, when Nikolai is walking towards them, he's got his hand down on a pocket, the right of his shorts. You'll hear from people from his group that that's where he kept his knife. You'll see in the video that this, he then starts to run. He runs at the boys who are down in their tubes. That's the only time in this video you'll see Nikolai run when he runs up on the group of teenage boys. He doesn't even run after stabbing five people he walks away. There's his hand on that pocket. He's carrying his snorkel and goggles. That group in the background there, in the middle photo, that's the Carlson's group that eventually come over in response to the yells of the kids. Nikolai puts his goggles in his mouth and grabs onto their tubes with two hands. You'll hear in the video, the boys are yelling, whoa, whoa, what's this guy doing, weirdo? You can see their reactions in the video. That's Alex Bang on the left. Nikolai drops his goggles and snorkel in the water. He then starts reaching in the water where they fall into the water. He starts walking around their tubes. They're yelling at him, get away, get away from us, walk away. They're also chirping at him. You'll hear Juwan saying, he's a pedophile. Nikolai says something back, you can't hear it in the video. He's standing, now Nick, this is facing downriver, so the direction they're tubing, that's that bridge going over the river in the back, background. Boys are yelling, get away. That's Isaac in the middle photo with the white half, purple chunks. That's Isaac again in the left photo, standing with his hands up, fingers splayed. You see a gold bracelet on his left wrist. You see that again later in the video. At this point in the video, you hear the boys start to cheer. And that's because the, you'll hear from them that the Carlsons, some adults, were coming over to help. Those two people you see walking over, 
are Madison and Dante. Madison's later punched, Dante's later stabbed. There's Isaac's bracelet. As Madison is walking over, she's yelling, go, go, go. Nikolai says, you'll hear it in the video, they took my snorkel. Madison's pointing and yelling for him to go. You can see in that pocket on his shorts, a metallic clip of his pocket knife. Madison's pointing and yelling at him to go. Nikolai turns his back to her, looks back at the group of boys in the right photo. She drags him back away from the boys, back to her. You hear from her, that's why she went over them in the first place, was to try to get him away from the boys. She keeps telling him to go. He starts smiling, he waves upstream towards his group. More women from the Carlson group come over. That's Riley in the middle, in that middle photo. She ends up getting stabbed. Right photo, you can see Nikolai puts his hand on that knife in his pocket again. He's smiling. The boys are laughing. They're drunk 17-year-old boys. They have nothing in their hands, as you'll see in the video. They're laughing and pointing at Nikolai. He's smiling. And then you'll see his hands start moving. You can't quite see what they're doing. You can see they come together in front of his waist. You can see behind him, there's nothing but clear and empty water. As Madison and Riley, two women, are talking to him, telling him to leave, he takes out his knife. He opens it, blade up, still smirking, looking straight at the women. You'll not see Nikolai raise his knife and brandish it. You'll not hear him yell at anyone to get back. You'll not see him say anything at this point in the video after he takes his knife out. You'll not see him try to take a step back or walk away. You will see him looking around, smirking, while continuing to hold the knife down by his side. While holding the knife, he looks around, looks back over at the boys. You can see Riley leaning over, trying to keep his attention. Nothing but clear water behind him. You'll see Madison's got sunglasses on. It's more people from the Carlson group come over. That's AJ in the yellow swim trunks. He gets ultimately stabbed, you'll see. That's Dante in the right photo. He gets stabbed. This entire video is three minutes and 23 seconds long. It's not a very long video, but from the point in the video when witnesses say Nikolai punched Madison until you see Nikolai walking off after having stabbed five people is only about 20 to 25 seconds. It happens very fast in the video. You'll see that when you see it played in real time. You'll see the boys are loud, they're boisterous. You'll hear that in the video. There's a lot of yelling. Pedophile. He's looking for little girls. Go, get away from us. You'll not hear anyone in the video threaten Nikolai. You'll not see anyone raising fist to him before it turns physical. You won't see anyone besides Nikolai with a weapon. You won't see the boys touch Nikolai until after stabbings start. The next portions of the still frames is moments before the witnesses say it turned physical when Nikolai punched Madison in the face, who was one of the women standing in front of him. The Carlsons say he punched Madison. The boys, the teenagers, say he punched the blonde girl. They didn't know her name. They didn't know each other. It happens fast. Remember, up to this point, Nikolai already has the knife in his hand. After it pans, from the last frames I showed you, AJ was walking over in the yellow swim trunks. The video pans back to the middle. You see Madison and Riley are standing in front of Nikolai. The video pans to the left. You see the boys still laughing. That's Isaac in the background of the middle photo. He's pretty much just standing there in the background. Then you see everybody react and you hear it. You hear the change in the tone. And this is when witnesses say Nikolai punched Madison in the face. You'll hear Madison testify and Nikolai punched her in the face. Madison's sunglasses are no longer on her head. We're here to testify that they got knocked off when he hit her. After Nikolai punches Madison, Dante, her friend, punches Nikolai. You can see that in the right frame. Again, Madison's sunglasses no longer there. Nikolai goes down in the water. You can see in the right photo, he gets slapped. It's shallow water, his butt's in the water, essentially. That's AJ. Those photos pushing on Nikolai's back. You'll see that the push doesn't really do anything. Nikolai gets right up, 
with the knife in his right hand, lunges at AJ as AJ is going to push him again. As AJ is pushing Nikolai, Nikolai stabs into his lower abdomen with the blade up, slices out his stomach. You can see in that right photo, he just missed his throat, chin. In the middle photo, you can see AJ's stomach opened up on the bottom, right above the swim trunks. From the push from AJ, Nikolai goes down, lands in his butt in the water again. You won't see anyone in the video pounce on him at this point or approach him, try to hit him when he's down in the water. You see him try to grab at Tony. That's Tony, you'll hear that's Tony in the jean shorts. Tony walks by him. Tony has his back to Nikolai. And you'll hear Tony yelling in the video, get back, get back. You hear testimony from Tony that he thought he was breaking up a fist fight. So he's yelling at somebody off screen to get back. He has his back to Nikolai. Nikolai gets up still with the knife in his hand. That person in the top left of the left photo is Riley. So after Tony, you hear him yelling, directing somebody off screen to get back. He turns, over, turns to Nikolai and he's yelling, get back, get back. And you see him pointing in the video and yelling. And you see Nikolai's hand going back with the knife in it. He makes a stabbing motion off screen. Tony's yelling at him, get back. And then you see Riley's just been stabbed. That group in the background there that Nikolai's facing with nobody between him and that group is his group. That's his group of tubers. Tony, you'll see and you hear from him when he testifies that he's just yelling at Nikolai to go. Nikolai doesn't. Again, that's his group. In the right photo, the guy with the aviators, that's his friend, Ariel. Almost up to Nikolai. Nikolai doesn't walk back to his group. Instead, he turns to Tony with the knife in his right hand. He stabs at him twice. You can see Riley bleeding in the background. Ariel, Nikolai's friend, is there as he's launching the knife at Tony. That hand there on the bottom right-hand corner You'll see more clearly in the next still shots. Isaac goes to shove Nikolai. See the gold bracelet? As he's shoving Nikolai, Nikolai lunges out with the knife. Nikolai kind of stumbles back from the push. Comes back with his knife covered in blood and dripping blood. He can see the women recoiling from him. Nikolai ends up by his friend Ariel as he's stumbling from the push. You don't see Dante get stabbed in the video, but I expect you'll see evidence and testimony that it was after this. It's not until this point in the video, after he stabbed EJ, Riley, Tony, and Isaac, that you hear people start react and realize what's going on in the video. You hear that they all suddenly saw AJ, and you'll see in a second what they saw. Up until that point, people didn't realize that Nikolai was stabbing people. You'll hear in the video the shock and disbelief. That's what just happened. The camera pans around. You see Nikolai looking in the direction to where AJ and Isaac are. AJ is in the water, moving in his guts. Isaac's friends scatter and run. Juan, who's filming, runs back. Nikolai walks away. You can see at this point, if you recall the photo of Dante, he's got dark chunks on the bottom, white on top. He's got his hands on his torso and he's looking down. Nikolai continues to walk away. He walks by his friend Ariel. On that right photo, he's standing in front of Ernesto. He walks by Ernesto. On the right there, that's Alex Bing running to Isaac, who is collapsed in the water. You see AJ struggling. That's Nikolai by Ernesto. Nikolai continues walking. The camera pans away, and it pans back, Nikolai's off in the distance. Pans down a little bit, and that's what the middle photo is showing. And then you see, in the right, sorry, in the left photo, you see he's approaching the right shore. Camera pans down, pans back up, he's walking away from the right shore. Isaac's group and the Carlson's group start helping each other, try to get to shore, get the victims to shore. Isaac and AJ, who are collapsed. Nikolai starts walking back from the right, over across to where his group is at the sandbar. Camera pans around the water, it's water's running red, it's Isaac's hat floating by. 
Nikolai is almost back to his group. You see people trying to help Adrian and Isaac. You see a couple people from the Carlson's group start to call 911. We hear from the four people that were stabbed, and none of them saw Nikolai with the knife. They didn't notice he had a knife. They didn't know. They thought they were punched until they looked down and see all the blood. There's not going to be any testimony on what Isaac saw. If he saw Tony get stabbed right in front of him when he went to shove Nikolai, because Isaac's not going to be here to tell what he saw. You hear that some good Samaritans who are also tubing, some nurses, tended to AJ and Isaac until law enforcement and paramedics arrived. AJ, as a result, was disemboweled. He had to have emergency surgery. He was in the hospital for nearly a month and had to have numerous follow-up surgeries. Riley, who was in the bikini in that middle photo, was stabbed in the side. It sliced her diaphragm. She had to have emergency surgery. Tony was stabbed twice. One, he'll describe how he kind of blocked it. He thought it was a punch coming in, so it just kind of scratched him, but the other one went into his torso. Isaac was stabbed in the chest and the torso, cut clean through two ribs, and sliced his heart. Died almost immediately. He was 17 years old. Dante, was also stabbed in the torso. Nikolai returned to his group. You'll hear from people in his own group. He didn't really say what happened. He said, they took my knife. They stayed at the sandbar for a while. So a little while, sometime after law enforcement arrived. Multiple members of his group called 911. He did not. They reported they didn't know what happened, but multiple people were injured. One person from their group, Eric Von Williams, went over to help with the wounded. He also spoke with law enforcement when they got to the scene. He's the only one who did. At some point, Nikolai tells his group that they should just float to the exit. So they floated to the exit. You'll see that when law enforcement arrived on the scene, it was chaotic. Information they had was that an unknown subject stabbed five people. People didn't know where he was. They're all looking at AJ and Isaac and trying to help each other to shore and only paid attention to where the guy with the knife went. There's dozens of tubers that continue to go through. There's tubers running through the woods trying to find the guy who was stabbing people. Isaac and AJ, there was no place to get to them by road. Officers had to go to the nearest. They went to the 35 bridge and then they had to wade upstream to get to them and float them out on tubes. You see that when officers get there, there's bystanders, just other tubers intermixed with victims, intermixed with witnesses. Some of the witnesses were so emotional they couldn't even say, articulate what happened at first. So, Juwan, who filmed the video, he alerts law enforcement that he's got a video of it. And he pauses it at an image of Nikolai from the video. That office, that deputy, circulates it around to other law enforcement who are responding. Officers go down to the exit. One deputy walks right by Nikolai and his group because he's looking for somebody who matches that photo. Was the reports all that they had where he was by himself. Deputy walks right by Nikolai, but then two citizens, one employee of River's Edge who had the photo and a friend of the owner of River's Edge alerted law enforcement that they think this guy matches the photo. Nikolai is apprehended. <coughs> Members of the group asked, why is he being detained? You have the wrong guy. This is how he was dressed when they law enforcement contact with him. You'll see the body cam. Nikolai doesn't really show any emotion when he's taken into custody. You'll see a video of Sheriff Knudsen when Nikolai is in the back of the squad car. Sheriff Knudsen goes to check on him. How are you doing? You doing all right? Nikolai says, what's going on? I hear somebody got stabbed. And I fit the description. Nikolai is later told by officers that he's under arrest for homicide and attempted homicide. Ultimately, Nikolai is interviewed by Lieutenant Randy Hart. In that video, you'll see the recording of that interview. His version varies drastically from the video of the incident.
The interview is about 45 minutes long. We'll get to see that video, but I'll highlight some portions of it. When Nikolai is interviewed, he's not told there's a video. Lieutenant Clark shows him a screenshot, that one that went around the law enforcement. She asks if he knew that they took his picture. He says, no, he didn't know that. And then he asks if she has any other pictures of him. What other pictures did they give you of me? So up to this point, Nick Wyatt told his group they should leave the scene of the stabbing. He put on the jacket, hat, and sunglasses. He tried to walk by law enforcement at the exit. He said to Sheriff Knutson, I heard somebody got stabbed and he was told he was under arrest for homicide and attempted homicide. So you'll see in the video, Lieutenant Hart is explaining he doesn't need to speak with her. Nikolai responds, or I can say it was, uh, it was, it was self-defense, self-defense. There's lots of people uh, that came to me, self-defense, and they produced two weapons when I took from them. And that's the only thing I tell you. They were, they hit me, they were on top of me. That's, I don't remember anything after that. I just remember I ran away. You'll see that Nikolai repeats over and over throughout the interview that they pulled knives on him. Because of that, he feared for his life. He also repeatedly says they knocked his goggles off his face. He says they're trying to pull his swim trunks down. And uh, they are uh, snorkeling, so they took my snorkel away. They threw it in the water. They grabbed my pants. One wanted to pull my pants down, and I grabbed onto them. And I don't know who that kid was, but he produced, he had a knife, on, on him and there was another knife, a longer knife, looked like a kitchen knife. They came, they grabbed my snorkel, and they threw it in the water. His goggles are lost, they took them, they grabbed them off my face and threw them in the water. Not only does Nikolai say repeatedly throughout the interview that they pulled knives on him, he says, he did not have a knife. I feared for my life, there was the truth. And they started hitting me, pointing, pointed a knife at me and another kid pointed a knife. I thought that was it for me. So actually, I took it from, from one of the young kids, and I think that's when I swung back. When you watch the video, the only thing you'll see in other people's hands in that video are drinks, cell phones, and a vape pen. We'll hear testimony from both Isaac's group and the Carlson's group that none of them had knives. You fly again, and one had it in his hand, so I took his hand and I bent it. I poked him with his own hand, and I took him from his hand, and then I swung, so I don't know who I hit. I just know that I took the knife from, from one of those kids. Lieutenant Hart asks, um, did you have a knife with you? No, no, absolutely no. Nikolai says he's telling the truth that he does not know where his knife was. He says, I had, he says he had one earlier to cut the string for the tubes right at the beginning. I left it on the, I don't even know where at, what I did with it. I either gave it to one of the people or I put it in my truck. To tell you the truth, I don't even know. I don't even know uh, where it's at, to tell you the truth. Maybe one of the bags we had with it, with us, it may have been in, uh, I don't know, maybe I left it and put it back in the car. It really says he, everything happened fast. He doesn't know why they attacked him. I don't even know why they took my snorkel. I don't know why they wanted to pull my pants down. I don't know why they're being so mean. Why did they want to scare me with a knife? They're scaring people on the river. It's a family-oriented river with knives and what they did. I just grabbed the kid's knife. I didn't even know I was holding it right. I grabbed it from him because he tried to poke me with it. So I feared for my life. He says it over and over. They're pushing me, shoving, I tripped, I fell down. I got up and that's where I saw one of the kids there, closest kid with the knife and I grabbed the ball. Again, you'll hear he was already told he was under arrest for homicide. Nikolai asked Lieutenant Hart, so what happened? Can you tell me what happened? Lieutenant Hart says, yes. Four people went to the hospital with injuries. Nikolai says, oh my God. Lieutenant Hart says, and one person died. And Nikolai says, who oh, no. Lieutenant Hart says, I don't know their names or their genders, I don't know. And Nikolai asks, is that because they fought each other? Again, you'll see this in the video of Nikolai walking off to the right shore before walking back to his group. You'll hear from Gilma Constanza, was one of the tubers in his group, that as he walked back after the incident, he did not walk back directly to the group, walked over to the shore across from them and threw something onto the bank. This is a, you'll hear from Chuck Coleman from the Sheriff's Office. It's a 3D rendering, this is a bird's eye view of it. These are approximate locations. You'll hear on where things happened. 
river in this image is flowing downstream or down to the bottom, and so the bridge would be below this image. The white, in, the white dot is approximately where the boys were when Nikolai first made contact with them. They continued to drift down a little bit. The Carlson's group is that pink dot. They also continue to float down, so at the time of the incident, they were more kind of uh, parallel with Isaac's group. And then orange dot is the sandbar that you'll see in the video here, and you hear that the Nik Nikolai's group was. That star, you'll hear that's where law enforcement found the knife. This is that knife that was found on the shore. You'll hear that this knife was sent to Wisconsin State Crime Lab, tested positive for blood. It was compared to DNA samples of the five people that were stabbed. It had DNA, Dante, and Isaac on it. By close to trial, you'll see that these were senseless and horrific acts of violence, and all Nikolai had to do was walk away. At the close of trial, the state will ask you to find Nikolai Mew guilty of first degree intentional homicide of Isaac Schumann, attempted first degree intentional homicide of Riley Madison, AJ Martin, Dante Carlson, and Tony Carlson, <coughs> and Battery, and Madison Cohen. Thank you. Now that just may have been the most lip smacking hour of footage I have ever edited. See what I mean? It's disgusting. So let's just move right into the defense and their opening statement. All right, we are back on the record. Same appearances. Mr. Muir is present in the courtroom. The jury is present. Uh, we're ready for Mr. Nelson's opening statement. Mr. Nelson. Nick Mew standing in the river with 13 strangers, 13 drunk, angry strangers. 13 against one. They yelled and they screamed in order to attract a crowd. They got a crowd. They told lies to make the crowd angry. He's looking for little girls. He's looking for little girls. They layered their lies. They made them louder to make the crowd more angry. He's a predator. He's a predator. Pedophile. They chanted. They pulled on him. They closed the space around him. They got up in his face and they pushed him. Somebody else pushed him. And they pointed and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed. When he put up his left hand to block and protect himself as they're in his space, in his face, he puts up his left hand to protect himself. And then they got violent. They got violent. They knocked a grown man, punched him, knocked him into the water. And when he's down in the water, they come up on him and they hit him again when he's down in the water. When he tries to get up out of the water, they attack him from the front, smack him across the front of the face, while somebody else comes from behind and starts pushing him down. In that moment, he feared for his life, and he responded in self-defense. Let me show you what they did. Dante Carlson, who had earlier come over into that group, right? his dad had sent him over to help Nick. But the crowd got Dante going, and he was, it didn't matter. He was going to hit him. And when the opportunity arose, as Dante Carlson told you, will tell you, he laid him out. Knocks a grown man back off of his feet, where it's not just his butt. You'll see on the video, it's his shoulder, it's his head. He goes into the water. He didn't have a measuring stick. He wasn't figuring out what the height of the water is. He went in the water. 
because they hit him into the water. And when he's down, you'll see he's down in the water. And Dante Carlson, who punched him with his right hand, right? He was so confident. He was so confident. Had his beer in his left hand. And then he's given a beat down with his right hand. He then runs around him as, Don, as Nick is falling into the water. And he's in the water. He runs around him with the beer in his hand because he knows he's got his group around him. And then he comes around and he smacks him again. You can see in the first photo, you can see the shadow of Dante's arm coming across. And you can see it hits him across the face and across the ear. That's not just a slap. That's a full hand. You'll watch the video. It knocks him down. And then when he's down, he's down in the water, you'll see A.J. Carlson, who you'll hear tells you that he came over there to mediate. But for whatever reason, maybe it's because of a crowd, maybe it's because of a mob, maybe it's some other mentality. But when this happens, he sees this old man down on the ground. He doesn't go to help him. He goes to push him from behind. And while he's pushing him from behind, look in the upper corner there. That's Dante's arm. You can see in the middle slide, that's Dante's head, hand, smacking Mew across the front of his head. And then you'll see on the third slide, that's where he's extending through. So confident, he's going to beat this old man down that he keeps the drink in his hand. That's the close-up where you can see through there Dante Carlson hitting Nick Mew in the face while his friend attacks him from behind. You're going to need to make some choices in this case, right? Some, make some decisions. Some of the things that maybe that might help you to do. Let me just take a step right back, all right? Who is Nick Mew? Who's the man that they wanted to beat down on the river? We're going to tell you about that. How did he get there? What made him be in the river on that day, as we saw here earlier? And we'll tell you that story. And then lastly, why did this angry mob, this pack of players, why did they attack him? And we're going to tell you that. First, who is Nick, right? Nick's 54 years old, lives in Prior Lake. He's married, right? You see a photo of, you'll hear from his wife, Sandy, right? She's gonna be a witness. She was there with him that day. Him and a bunch of other 50-year-olds went to go have a peaceful day on the river. Nick grew up in Romania, right? And when he was about 15 or 16, he immigrated over here. We're not going to get really into it. Romania was not a good place to be in the 80s. Communist dictator, all kinds of other bad stuff was going on. And Nick's dad, like a lot of people in the world, wanted to have a better place for his family to grow up. So they, as political refugees, were accepted by a church in Minnesota, and they came over to Minnesota. When Nick was growing up, his first language was Romanian. Because he lived in this communist dictatorship, he also needed to learn Russian. Because he was in Europe, he also learned to speak French. And because he's this pretty, pretty smart guy, he also learned Latin. So when he was 15 and 16, he comes over to the United States, and then he picks up English as his fifth language. He can speak fluid English. He's fine. But I think it's important for you to know that's not his first language. When he, he graduates from high school in Minnesota, he decides he wants to go on and further his education. And he goes to school in South Dakota. He becomes a mechanical engineer. And he works. He's worked as a mechanical engineer for years and years. A bit of a handyman, as I imagine a lot of engineers are, right? I don't think of myself as a, as a handyman. He's a handyman, good with tools, hangs out with tools. And you'll hear from other people how he's used tools in the past. And you'll hear, that he, as you'll hear on the tape, as he tells the police, you know, living a peaceful, quiet life in Minnesota, never been in trouble before. 
Him and some of his work friends, as all of us sometimes as adults, our circle of friends tends to be people that we work with. He has a group of friends, Amanda and Ernesto. They've been down the Apple River before. In fact, fact, they've invited him before, and he's been down the river one time before, several, several years earlier. So they make a plan with all of those, the group of people that we saw, right? Oh, I forgot one thing here. Nick, like a lot of people, maybe as they get older, isn't of the best health. In 2020, he had a heart attack, and he needed to have quadruple bypass open heart surgery. So these are the photos of him recovering from that, and it took him some time. And he'll tell you how that still makes him feel fragile, right? He doesn't feel as fit as he was when he was 18 or 22. So he decides to get out on the river with his friends. These are some of the friends. And as you'll see in photos, right, he's in the water that day. It's warm that day. Sometimes he's wearing his sunglasses. Sometimes he's not. Sometimes he's got a hat on. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he has his shirt on. Sometimes he doesn't. This is the photo of the start, which is pretty much the exact same thing Wake he was wearing at the end. Um, His friends Amanda and Ernesto, asked him to come along. There's a lot of other adults that are coming, right? There's none of these, there's no 20-somethings, no teenagers. They pack food and coolers. Sure, they have a couple of beers, but it's really just a time to get together with their other adults and float peacefully down the river. Nick likes to snorkel, right? So he brought his goggles and his snorkel, right? That's just kind of who Nick is. He's a bit of an explorer, a bit of a curious mind, and he'd brought his goggles and snorkel, and you'll see a video of him prior to this where he's just kind of laying in the water, letting the water rush over him, Only he kind of floats there with the goggles and the snorkel, and he's looking at the bottom of the water. Probably not a lot of exciting things at the bottom of the water in Apple River, but he was there to see it if there was something there. Before he leaves, he gets a call from his friend Ernesto, because Ernesto knows Nick and knows that Nick's a bit of a handyman, and is like, hey, remember last time? We had all those strings. We got all those strings. You got to cut up stuff. You got to do this. Can you bring that little pocket knife that you've got, that utility knife? I've seen you use it at my house. You've used it as a tool. Make sure you bring that because we need to cut up some of the strings. So he does. Gets, gets back, packs that up, brings it along. And sure enough, when they get there, they have uh, their provided strings. And the people you'll see, they tie up tubes. They tie up coolers. They tie up everything else. And he uses the, uh, his pocket knife to sometimes cut those up, right? You'll also see as he's going through on the river that day that his shoes kind of fall apart, right? And you'll see that pictures of his shoes, he's got strings, and he's tied them up, and he continues to cut with the little pocket knife that he has to make sure that his shoes, footwear, are something that he can have. So they float down the river. All right, this is the group. You saw that photo already with uh, Mr. Anderson showed that to them, right? And again, here, here he has the hat on. Here he's got the hat off. Uh, you'll see later, not surprisingly, when he goes to snorkel, he doesn't have his sunglasses on. And sometimes when he snorkeled, he had his shirt on. Other times he took it off. Here's another picture of him on the river with the group. Again, has the hat back on, depending upon what the sun is like. So, how did he get there, right? Well, as we talked about, Ariel, his friend, loses his phone, right? And whether they wanted to look for it or didn't want to look for it, I don't know how that's relevant. I don't know how his wanting to go help his friend look for his phone is any way important. You'll get to decide that. But we know at the end of the day is, it's uncontested, his friend lost his phone. And as you saw in some of those photos, they have these little bags that they put them on, and they didn't know if it was going to float or if it was going to sink. But the water between him and the other two groups was downstream. So if something went into the water, it would float towards where those other two groups were. So Nick used his head and walked where he thought the the the, uh, phone was going to float to, and he goes looking for it, right? And then while he's looking for it, he runs into another group, right? And this is the group that, that we're gonna talk about, two different groups, right? The first group he runs into is this group of high school, right? And you're gonna hear that they're drunk. You're gonna hear that they were smoking stuff, 
the one piece of evidence that we know for sure is that at the time of the autopsy, Isaac Schumann's blood alcohol concentration was 0.219. And if you ask his friends, his friends are going to say he was the most sober one in the group. So we have this group, they're drunk, they're loud, there's six of them, they're football players, they've run as a pack together before, and you're going to hear some videos, they're a quite confident group, right? And they see this man, this man that maybe others are going to judge upon his appearance, this group of six see him and they start making judgments about him based upon what he looks like. He's an old man in the river with goggles, and they don't like it. So they start calling him names. Right? And there's a video. You're going to hear it because they, they start harassing him. They start heckling him. They're basically trying to humiliate him. And Mr. Cockfield, one of the football players, he grabs his phone out, and he thinks it's funny enough that he's going to record it. And you'll see that recording just before this where he says, grown man looking for little girls. And he thinks it's really funny. And then he screams out, raper. He doesn't scream that out for his benefit of his five football friends that are with him. He screams it out to draw a crowd, get other people involved. Now, Mr. Mew may or may not have heard that exact thing, but he hears them yelling and he turns around. And what does he see? He's looking for a phone. Right? We know that. And when he turns around, he sees somebody holding up a phone. Maybe he's wrong, maybe he's mistaken about why they're holding up the phone, but he sees them holding up a phone, so he turns around to approach them, because he thinks that's the phone he's looking for. And looking for this phone, it floated down this way, these kids are yelling, and he starts jogging towards them. As you saw, as he jogs toward them, he's an unfit 260-pound man trying to move through the water, and he picks up his feet for about four steps, and then he reaches his hands out to grab their tubes, and when he does so, he puts the snorkel in the goggles in his mouth. Maybe they thought it was an act of aggression. I don't really think it was. You'll get to see it and watch it. But we know nothing happens after that, because as soon as he goes and approaches, the goggles and the snorkel drop. He loses them, and he immediately starts looking for them. That's about five seconds into the video. He starts looking for them, and they st start yelling at him, Get away, get away, get away. So if this is the this is the tubes, right? You as the jury, you're looking downstream this way, right? Nick is standing here in front of the tubes. He looks, he comes up, and then he walks to the other side of their tubes. And he's now on this side of their tubes, downstream from them. He's downstream because that's where he thinks the goggles and the snorkels come. And did he tell the police officer that he thought they knocked the goggles and snorkels out of his hand? Yes, he did. Is that what he believed happened? Yes, it was. Is that what really happened? No, that's not what happened. And the great thing you're going to be able to see in this case is there's a video. There's a video that we can check everybody's testimony against. And you know what? Riley Madison got it wrong. Dante Carlson got it wrong. Madison Cohen got it wrong. Anthony Carlson got it wrong. Pretty much every witness, when you compare their human memory against the video, they got it wrong. Because we're humans. We can't get it as good as the video does. So he got that wrong, but he's still nevertheless looking for his goggles. His goggles are down in the water. He's looking for it. Right? He starts walking around there. There's nothing that prevents this group of football players who are screaming at him from just walking around. He's one man, maybe two feet wide. And you hear from there, they talk about him walking away, but they can just walk, just float on by and leave this man alone. But they stay to harass, they stay to heckle, they stay to humiliate. Because he starts walking away from them. And if you watch and you count, you watch it enough times, he takes about 10 steps away from them. And it's sometime during those 10 steps, it's sometime during those 10 steps when that group says, you got 10 seconds. That's what this group of drunk teenagers says to that old man. And he's walking away at that point. And then what you'll see when the video comes back, he walked away, 
and followed. They followed. They didn't go around. They went right up to him where he had walked away. Now remember, as he's walking in this direction, his group is 200 and some feet that way, 280 feet that way. This water is deeper. As he starts walking away, he gets into deeper water. He doesn't have his goggles, doesn't have his snorkel, still can't find the phone. He's getting farther away from this group. The drunken teenagers are yelling at him. And now they keep following this video, right? We're going to show some slides from the video. And it's super important, obviously. We're very thankful that we have it so that you will know exactly what happened. But what you've got to remember is the video is taken by Juwan Cockfield. It is from Juwan Cockfield's perspective. It's from his point of view, right? It makes it obvious. And so the person that we're watching oftentimes is Nick Mew, right? But you need to know, which is obvious, that the video is not from Nick's perspective. We're not watching it from Nick's perspective. We're watching it from somebody else's perspective. And why is that important? Because the judge is going to tell you, right? It's important because at the end of the case, you'll need to determine the reasonableness of his beliefs from his point of view. You'll need to determine the reasonableness of his beliefs, beliefs, not actions. You're here to determine his beliefs and reasonableness from his point of view. So as you're watching that video, you're going to be asked at the end to be like, what would someone in Mew's position from that standpoint, what would they feel? What would they believe? Let me just quickly read to this, right? If I can, the law of self-defense. In determining reasonableness, a belief may be reasonable even though mistaken. In determining whether Nick Mew's beliefs were reasonable, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in Nick's position under the circumstances that existed at the time of the alleged offense. Not 30 seconds before, not a minute before, at the time of the alleged offense. The reasonableness of Nick's beliefs must be determined from the standpoint of Nick Mew at the time of his acts, and not from the viewpoint of the jury now. And so I say that to you just so you know when we're looking at the evidence, what you're going to be asked to do at the end. So they, right, they get him into, the, him into this position, and this is 50 seconds into the video. He's walked 10 steps away. They come up to him and approach him and cut him off. So he walks away one time. They follow him. But Nick, right, sees, right, so he's here. He's got a group of people here. And he looks off to his left, and he sees a group of adults. There's two adults coming this way. Great. Adults, not drunk teenagers. Adults are coming this way. He doesn't continue to engage with this. He gets and starts walking over here. He walks over to engage with the adults in the hope, as I think most of us do, when we see perhaps another adult and we're dealing with a group of drunk teenagers, maybe I can appeal to reason. These are adults. And when he walks over this way and the path down the river is wide open, those drunk teenagers follow him. Follow him over here where he then gets confronted by Madison Cohen. And Madison Cohen is not listening. She's not there for an appeal to reason. Her immediate words are to Nick Mew in his face, go get the Fuck out, go. And you'll see Nick's reaction is kind of like, as you heard from the, uh, look, they have my goggles. Like, why are you in my face? What's going on? And you can see, they'll call it a smirk. They'll call it a smile. Look, there's 4,819 frames in that video. 4,819 frames. I have no doubt that you can pause on one of those 4,819 frames and find a photo where somebody's mouth is making a particular shape of anything at any time. Is he smirking? Is he smiling? You watch. You decide. Because he looks perplexed. He's immediately confronted, and he starts to give an explanation, and Dante Carlson tells him, it doesn't matter. Right? Appeal to reason? Nope. 
We're not doing that. That's kicked out the door. There is no appeal to reason at all. And while this is going on, the Carlson group, right, who sent two people over, also has Quentin Carlson. And he's an older duck. Madison Cohen, Dante Carlson, A.J. Martin, they're in their early 20s, which is fine. They're certainly adults, but that might be different than somebody in their 40s. Quentin Carlson, he sees what's going on, and what he says, I was worried about the group against one guy. I was worried that they were going to gang up on him and something bad was going to happen to the old guy. So I told my son Tony and Dante to go make sure they don't attack that old guy. That's not somebody looking at it from Nick's perspective, but that's somebody who can see maybe what Nick sees, hear what Nick hears, and his thought is, ooh, something bad's gonna happen to that old guy. So he sends over his kid. And when they come over, right, the high school group continues in what I think we now know, it's a new term, is they gaslight him. They just start making up lies in order to affect his perception of reality and everybody else's perception of reality. As soon as that group comes over, that high school group says, he's a predator. And then immediately they're like, he's looking for little girls, he's looking for little girls. There will be zero evidence that there were ever little girls even anywhere near on that river. Zero. There's gonna be zero evidence that he was looking for little girls. But they drum up, right? They get this crowd going. They've got the two people here, and they start yelling that. And then the crowd gets to be more, right? As this is going on, it's about 113, 115 into it, where they start screaming at him. He's looking for little girls. And then you'll see as he's standing here, after he's walked away from that group, he walks over to the adults. He's kind of pointing at them like, I got my snorkel. And they confront him. And as he's standing there, he turns his back on her, and then and he just stands here. And as he's standing with his back turned and the path down the river is wide open, instead of just walking on by, Madison Cone decides she's going to put her hands on him and she grabs him and starts pulling him. Pulling him and you'll see he turns around and immediately looks to his hand and says, don't touch me. Don't put your hands on me. They don't walk away. They stand right there. The crowd... The drunk high schoolers continue to say, he's looking for little girls. Somebody says, is that what he said? And then it changes to the next lie is, we've got it on camera. We've got it on camera. You're going to see that they downloaded that phone. There ain't nothing like that on the camera. There ain't nothing like that on the camera because that's not what happened. Because these drunk teenagers were gaslighting him and they're enticing a crowd. Nick stands there. He's now got people all around him, right? They're chanting at him. He's a predator. He's a predator. He's all alone. He's getting, it's getting louder. He raises his left hand to his group. <coughs> like, they may need some help here. Like, something's going on, right? And when that happens, you'll see the camera. Juwan Cohen turns the camera to show where he's waving to. So the high school group has knowledge that Nick Mew, who's standing right here, doesn't want to go that way. Nick Mew, who's blocked right here, wants to go that way. Because that's where his group is, because that's where everybody looks. And you'll see on the camera, Madison Cohen, as she stands and he waves, she turns and looks and sees he's got some friends. So does Madison Cohen say, yeah, why don't you go that way? She doesn't. What she does is she reaches to her friends and says, hey, get over here. She calls in more numbers. She calls in more numbers to confront him. Because at that point, it was eight against one, and she wanted more. So she brought over Riley. She brought over Janelle. She brought over Gabby. And then she calls for Anthony. And then she calls for AJ. And then it's those 13 people that surround him, right? And they're standing there, and you're going to see they're all around him. They are relentless in what they're yelling and screaming. From his standpoint, this is like, what is happening? What world did I just step into in which there's this group of drunk kids, drunk teenagers, who they want to say kids, I get it, but you saw those pictures. 
they're all bigger than Nick. Nick's smaller than he was then, right? But he hasn't grown any. He's just shrunk more, right? But he's not a big, fit guy, right? They're screaming. They're chanting, right? And at that point, yes, Nick, outnumbered 13 to 1, reaches in his pocket, finds his pocket knife, opens it up, and stands there with it. He doesn't brandish it, no, but he doesn't hide it. He's standing there with it. His belief at that point is, I don't want to use this. I don't think showing it to him is going to help. But if something happens, I need to, I don't know what's going to happen. So he's standing there with the knife. And as he's standing there with the knife, Riley Madison is right in front of him. And she pushes on him. You'll see that in the video. And then next to her, who's blocking him from his people, is Madison Cohn. She takes her right hand and she pushes his left shoulder. And he has to go back. She pushes him back. And while all this is going on, the group of drunk teenagers are screaming, chanting, yelling. The numbers are getting bigger. They come over towards him. All right. They push him again. They block his path. And this is the, the same. That's what it looks like. You're Mew. You're looking upriver to see where your safety is. Behind you is deeper water. You've walked in that direction before. You appealed to reason, and they said, it doesn't matter. They're up in his face, right? And Madison Cohen's pushing and pointing at him, right? And Mew's standing there. He's got the knife in his right hand. He doesn't use the knife. He's standing there while they're pushing and pointing at him, right? And when he does that, all of a sudden, that's when Dante Carlson gets by, right? He's predisposed for violence, I submit to you. That's the entire purpose of the gaslighting, of getting the crowd there, of yelling with the crowd, of getting it all jacked up, is Jawan Cohen wanted to record a viral video in which some old man was getting beat down and he was going to get it on tape. He created that world. He put him in that world. I object a lot of this is argument, not summarizing. Stay, please focus on what you anticipate the evidence will show. That's what the evidence is going to show, right? Dante Carlson has told you before, and he'll say, it doesn't matter, right? At that moment, that's when, that's when Nick Mew raises his left hand to protect himself. He's raised it before to call for help. I think I missed it. He raised another time to call for help a second time, and now they're crowded around him in his face. He raises his hand to protect it, and that's when they get violent, right? It's a push. It's a push to protect himself, not a punch. The evidence. You'll watch that video. You might watch it 20 times. It's not on the video. There's no punch on the video. She's standing there yelling, and when she's standing there yelling, there are two people between her and Nick Mew. He's got the knife in his right hand, Right? It's not on the video. There's no physical evidence. She says he punches her with his right hand. He's got the knife in his right hand. There's not a mark on her. You're going to see from John Schultz, his video. He spoke with her right then. He's right in her face. He's got a body cam. You'll get to see the body cam of her face. And she, not a blemish on it. Not a mark on it doesn't support that he punched her. Third thing, multiple evolving stories. Listen to what the witnesses say. Who really says is there a punch and what position were they in to say it? Because here's what they said before. Quentin Carlson, he told the police, she said he was punched, she said she, he punched her, but they said it was a slap. So everybody else initially said it was a slap. Gabby, one of the witnesses says, he smacked her with his left hand. She's consistent with he raised his left hand. Uh, Mr. V Alexander Vang, one of the high school kids, says he hit her with an open hand with his left hand. AJ, he says he saw him pull her hair, which nobody's going to say. That's just wrong. Nobody's going to say anything along those lines. Dante, the person who laid him out after he said that, spoke with the police, and initially what he said to the police 
is he saw, I saw Mew make a swift motion to Riley Madison. Then he says, I saw Mew make a motion towards Riley Madison. Then he says, I saw Mew make a swift motion to Riley Madison. Then he says a fourth time, swift motion, Riley Madison. I don't know what he's going to say when he comes up there now, but what he said before isn't a punch, and it wasn't to Madison Cohen. That's when the violence begins, right? They attract the crowd. They moved in closer. Now, one of the things you're going to want to ask, and we will ask that, is when this happens, this group of 13 is around, and the old man gets knocked, and he's down in the ground. Listen to the video. Is there anybody in the group that says, whoa, this is out of hand? No. You'll hear when he gets knocked on the ground, the volume goes up. The cackling and the laughing goes up. And the videographer pushes people away to get in closer to document the beatdown as well as he can. This isn't somebody that's just taking a video on the side and then again, we move around. Dante Carlson is confident enough to still have the beer in his hand while this happens. Mew's response is in self-defense, right? People come at him, and he makes a quick, short jab motion. He believes he has to use the knife because he's outnumbered. A.J. Martin wants. Wiley Madison wants. Dante Carlson twice but he only has two stitches. Isaac Schumann wants, Dante Carlson wants. When they come at him, he gives a quick jab, they back up, he doesn't lunge for them, he doesn't follow them, he doesn't recklessly swing it around. They come at him after they gave him a beat down and he jabs up. Even Brandy Hart, I think, you're gonna hear from her, right? When Mr. Droff, he asked her questions. When people attacked you, he responded. She agrees with that. So, what happens is pretty much all on video, right? At the end, the judge is going to read you that jury instruction similar to what he did about credibility. And how much of credibility is going to play a part in this trial is going to be up to you. You guys are the finders of fact. You decide what happens. But I'd submit to you, it's all on video. Pretty much know what happened because it's on video. So we can talk about credibility. Nick spoke with the police, right? He told them he was afraid. He told them he feared for his life. He told them he was acting in self-defense. He also told them, I don't really remember anything. And he lied to the police about the knife. He did. He lied about the knife. It was his knife. He brought it. He was outnumbered. He believed he needed to use it. The truth is, he used it because he was surrounded by that angry mob and he was afraid. Right? When their attacks stopped, he walked away. When they stopped, kept coming at him and every one of them coming at him. Right? He responded like a victim of trauma response. You'll hear from witnesses in his group who will say he looked like he was in shock. He was white as a ghost. From his perspective, right, he had just been attacked by an angry mob who was trying to kill him, and he, he, got, his way, he got out of there. So as he walks back, he still has fear, right? It's not something that just goes away. That fear was deep inside of him at that point. And as he walks away, he wants nothing to do with the group that just attacked him. He wants nothing to do with the knife. And he tosses it up onto the shore. Maybe not the best decision. Maybe not how he should have responded. But he was suffering from serious shock and trauma at that time. And that's what he did. It's not going to be a contested fact. He looks back to his group, right? And they'll say that he's wide-eyed, he's white as a ghost. Um, remember, he'd just been repeatedly hit in the head, pushed down into the water, and his body continued to respond in that way. When he walked away, he knew he'd got some quick jab motions. He didn't know the extent of anyone's injuries. 
Did he hear them yelling? Sure. They'd been yelling for two minutes, screaming and yelling at him. He had been in trauma at that point. He didn't know what the yelling was about. He didn't know that anyone had died. Maybe he should have. Okay, fair enough. But in that situation, would you expect him who'd just been attacked and responded in just short, quick jab motions to know the extent of everyone's injuries? They go back, and everyone's like waiting, waiting, waiting. Traffic on the river pretty much shuts down, and they wait there. When the police come by and kind of basically move everybody along, his group moves along to the exit. He's got his hat and his sunglasses and his shirt on, just like he did at the start of the trip. Right? He's been in shock. He'll tell you he was cold. So there's really, these are the three things that you need to think about, right? What happened? Don't think it's going to be a big mystery. It's on video. And I hope that that's helpful to you, because the facts, I don't think, are going to be very contested. Two, you are going to be asked, what did Nick believe, right? He told the police, and he'll tell you, he feared for his life. In that moment, against that group who were violent with him and knocked him down, he feared for his life, right? The video evidence supports this. And I'd ask you rhetorically, what other reason is there? What other reason could there be? They came at him. He, he was in fear. He responded. The last question, were his beliefs reasonable? I don't want to get the labor of the point about the law. Right? A belief may be reasonable, even though mistaken. In determining whether Nick Mew's beliefs were reasonable, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in Nick Mew's position under the circumstances that existed at the time of the alleged offense. So what do we know that might help you to decide that, right? We know he walked away and they followed. We know he tried explaining to them and they said, it doesn't matter. We know they told lies about him to incite the crowd. We know he knows that those were lies and he was watching as this crowd gets louder and more intense and bigger. We know they cut him off from where he wanted to go back up to his wife and his friends. We know that somebody else that was watching who is kind of like Nick, a little bit younger, about the same fitness level though, and when that person, Quentin Carlson, sees what's going on, his first thought is, there's something bad that's going to happen to that old guy. We know he was surrounded, we know he was outnumbered, and we know that this environment was right for violence. That's the, violent, that's the environment they carry. And we know that Nick is fragile. He believed he was fragile. This is somebody who went through open heart surgery within a couple of years. He didn't have fitness. They attacked him, kept attacking him. And they gave him every reason to believe they weren't going to stop. Were his beliefs reasonable? This is Isaac Schumann. I'm sure he is a wonderful man, wonderful human being. We're going to hear a lot about him. But in this moment, on this day, on that river, when he was drunk, he tried to strangle Nick. His hands were on his throat. He was pushing up against Nick Mew. And Nick reaches out as he's falling back. His belief at the time, when he's being strangled after being constantly attacked, was he needed to get out of And the only way that he could do that was with his knife. He believed his life was in danger. At the end of the trial, we're going to come back up here, right? We'll be back up here, and we're going to ask you to return a verdict of not guilty. The judge will tell you, if you can reconcile the evidence on any reasonable hypothesis consistent with Nick's innocence, 
you must do so. You must return a verdict. Only reasonable hypothesis in this case is he feared for his life. So at the end, we'll ask you to do your duty. I'm not really sure what happened to the audio there at the end, but that's the story the defense is going with. And one thing I've noticed about this case, the opinion is split pretty much 50-50. It's right down the middle. But I'll go ahead and tell you, I see self-defense, but I haven't seen the entire trial yet. I've seen a lot of key evidence, but I haven't seen the whole thing. So my opinion could change. We'll see. But on the day that the verdict came out, I heard Frank say this. Yeah, listen. I, I, I wish the kids were raised better. I wish if they were raised differently, if there was some diff, if there was something different, different programming inside of them, uh, that would have never happened. But I'll tell you, uh, I, I would be very. I don't know if I would have a, a very much more self-control than he did. And I'm always carrying something. I couldn't agree with him more. He's spot on. So now I'm going to start working on the witness testimony from day one. I'll see you soon. But I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I'm going to go to bed. Thank you. Thanks for watching.